Welcome to the 69th episode of the New Ventures podcast. I am your host, Sanjoy Sanyal, the founder of Regain Paradise, a boutique climate finance firm, and a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Judge Business School. In these series of conversations, I discover climate solutions using artificial intelligence. Our guest for today is Juna Mikula, the chief scientist at SoilWatch. SoilWatch is building a platform for nature-based solutions which help in food security and land restoration. Welcome, Juna. Thank you, Sanjoy. Pleasure to be in your show. Juna, let's just start by asking you a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. I'm born and raised in Finland. I worked almost 10 years in East and North Africa, uh, mainly on agriculture, food security, and natural resource management. I was working both for international development agencies, different UN agencies like the World Food Program, the ILO, and also on the private sector. We, for instance, built a company that exported organic avocados to Europe. So at the same point, I started to think especially what kind of market-based incentives we have for sustainable development, especially for sustainable land use. We also saw that part of the areas where we work, many socioeconomic problems were caused by depleting natural resources. So land degradation, a lot of soil fertility, deforestation, flooding, droughts. We started soil works three years ago. What we saw in most of the international development programs, kind of the environmental factors were not adequately built in to the program. So there was kind of lack of connection and understanding how healthy ecosystem also uh, promote socioeconomic development. So we wanted to provide basically a solution for that so that we could monitor and, and model that. And also what we saw, what was going on in the voluntary carbon market, we thought the kind of the social element many times was not strong enough. So we also wanted to help project developers in the voluntary carbon market to develop uh, stronger projects that have a kind of a stronger social component as well. And uh, yeah, now I've been working as um, a chief scientist. The soil was also doing at the same time PhD, kind of on the same topic here at the University of Arizona. So now I'm based in Arizona and I spent some time here in East Africa as well. Well, what I was most intrigued by your background was that you know you had worked in a variety of uh, startup organizations, large organizations, international organizations. You'd worked both in the developing countries and, and in Africa. You know, that's not a very typical background we people have. There must have been some experiences which stood out, which helped you start Soil Watch. I've been working with the smallholder farmers all my life. I, I went to and worked in an organic farm in the in the border of Congo and Uganda when I was 19. We was totally self-sustained farm. We only got sugar and coffee that we bought. Everything else we produced ourselves. And starting from there, I, I've been working on giving loans for smaller farmers, working with them with the UN agencies, buying food from them. It's, it's kind of just a, the end of the journey with, with soil Watch. I think what has become very clear for me is that we talk about climate change, but what's actually happening is that all the, we're going beyond all the planetary boundaries. The areas where I work, I see very rapid deforestation. Uh, I see a very rapid loss of soil organic matter, which affects the yields, which actually then increases the deforestation as well, because as the yields go down, we need more cropland area to produce the same amount of food. My motivation is to build financial incentives for landscape restoration, so that it's, it becomes more profitable to conserve and restore nature than deflate it. So all my kind of work and thinking works on that. I, I think myself as an ecological economist, so trying to bring in the ecological data and the economic data and help to build basically business cases for conserving and restoring uh, nature. And when you started Soil Watch, did you have co-founders. Tell us a little bit about those very early days. In total, four co-founders, all of us kind of, in a way, similar background that we all work in the aid and development sector, although in different roles. We had somebody who had been working on the monitoring and evaluation, so basically evaluating whether the UN projects are hitting the targets for about 10 years, so data collection there. We had somebody who had been working on 
climate policy advocation in Ireland and in Brussels with some other agricultural UN agencies and then more technical person was be basically working as the Earth Observation Data Scientist with the World Bank. So it was more that we all kind of separately in our roles, we had seen, identified similar problems and then came up with a proposal or a solution that what should be done and decided to give a, take a shot at it and, and see what we can do if we come together. Lovely. And with Soil Watch, tell us a little bit about the types of organizations you target to sell your services. So at the moment, we uh, have kind of two different climate segments. One is all of us, we've been kind of working as uh, consultants and advisors for different UN agencies. So that is something what we continue, continue doing through the company. The international development agencies are an important kind of group of clients. Uh, but then the other group of clients are these project developers in the carbon market. So basically organizations that aggregate funding from the carbon market and then organize liquidity and then develop these projects. So provide funding, help to uh, work on the certification process. So help the project to get certified by VERRA, Gold Standard, and et cetera. So that's an, another a client group then. And then maybe possibly a third one, which is kind of in between. We work with different, typically agricultural organizations. So they can be some kind of industry associations or arts agribusinesses who also are looking to build a business case to transform to more regenerative, more sustainable ways of managing landscape and getting those metrics from the landscape that what, what's happening for the ecosystem on their supply chains. And do you do different things for these three different organizations? The UN agency, is it more monitoring and verification? Is it full project development services for the second category of project developers? Or do you offer the same types of services to these three categories of organizations? Yeah, it depends on the capabilities that they have in the organization. We basically do want a, a one-stop shop for both developing and managing and monitoring nature-based solutions. However, we don't trade the credits or own the credits. So we are just a purely like a technical partner there on the journey. We do helping kind of co-design the, the projects because it's also largely data, data management. It's both actually bringing together the socioeconomic and ecological data. So both modeling the, the potential carbon sequestration versus the baseline scenario, but then also helping to identify those kind of bundles of activities that are most likely to bring desired outcomes. And in our view, it's very important that these nature-based solutions doesn't only mean that we only address in climate change. So we either protecting carbon pools or, or restoring carbon pools, but they also truly solve uh, socioeconomic problems. For us, it's, for instance, one metrics is very important that the nature-based solutions also improve the local food security. We don't think they're sustainable. And also there's a lot of discussion whether nature-based solution Nature-based solutions are actually permanent, so whether the carbon is permanent, all of that comes down to the socioeconomic component. So uh, we believe that if it's truly benefiting the local community, there's much higher chance that the change in the ma improved management practices will, will be permanent. It, depending on the, of the client, typically project developers want to purely more a technical partner to model and monitor the, the carbon fluxes, the changes in carbon stocks. Typically, then the development agencies also want us to help them on, on kind of designing or how to build in nature-based solutions to their existing program portfolio. Great, actually. And what I really liked about the comment that you made is you look at nature-based solutions which have an impact on food security. So the way I'm interpreting that is nature-based solutions, carbon sequestration, there's a climate mitigation angle to that. But you're, what you're looking at is also a, a cross-cutting climate adaptation component to all these projects. Have I interpreted this correctly? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. As I mentioned, we have been working in our co-founding team, each individually, almost 10 years in sustainable development. Typically, what we see is that the development sector a long time ignore the ecological factors. So it was only about short-term solutions on, on maybe improving set time. So the economic indicators, food security, household income levels. 
I mean, in, in growth, the long-term uh, relationship between the community and, and the environment. And then the conservation came from the other direction and maybe sometimes with the same problems that was only for focusing on protecting the ecosystems, but not adequately uh, addressing different socioeconomic problems on the ground. We want to bring all of this together. We study science in silos. So still, in many, when we actually go to the field and we look at the different programs, what's happening there, we are still kind of oftentimes not adequately working on kind of integrated programs. Uh, at the same time, look to conserve and protect ecosystems and also address those socioeconomic problems. So when we, let's say, help to co-design this kind of monitoring and evaluation framework, so how do we track different key performance indicators in the program areas. We want to build in both the socioeconomic data and the ecological data and making sure that we have kind of an integrated program that addressing those both environmental and, and socioeconomic outcomes at targets at the same time. Well, you started actually sometime in the middle of the COVID, right? 2021. And since then, there has been obviously more interest in nature-based solutions but there's been also widespread criticism about the voluntary carbon markets. How has been business in the last two and a half, three years? Uh, we definitely, the, the macro environment in the last three years has been that. We started in the middle of the COVID. Then a lot of us, two of the co-founders, we worked a long time in Sudan. So a lot of our projects were in Sudan. So first we had a military coup d'etat in Sudan. Then the Ukraine war started, which also affected the carbon markets quite a bit. Then we had a, an, another war in Sudan, and, and then also voluntary carbon market has had its some, some challenges. I do think that Ukraine war has damaged much more the development of the carbon market than the criticism or, or the couple of newspaper articles. Just because it's, it's a distraction, it's taking away attention to climate change agenda. Uh, so it's been a tough macro climate. However, we do see a carbon market coming back quite strong this year. So definitely, I, I would say it has slowed down our growth. But this year looks really promising. So we are all, already about to sign. Uh, it's just uh, one month into the year. And I'm about to sign an, a number of larger projects for this year. So it seems like a little bit of a revival this year. That's obviously very promising. I didn't realize the geopolitical issues that affected your business, but congratulations nonetheless. Is the interest that you're seeing in this current year, is it coming from the uh, red plus type of conversations that is forestry and mitigation, or is it coming more from the preservation of the soil organic matter, more from the point of ecosystem restoration? You know, where is the demand coming from? I think most buyers in the carbon market, no buyer wants bad credits in the carbon market. So as long as the methodology is, is solid, there is definitely no skepticism over the red plus methodology, but Vera has just gone through a review of, of that method. Yeah, we work a lot on the improved agricultural programs. That sector up to now hasn't had those similar kind of problems with the with baseline calculations. So Yes, there is a, for us, this criticism is good because, well, even though maybe it has slowed down a little bit of the growth of the market, but from the early days, we were not just looking into meat sethine method of metal costing, but we wanted to go beyond. We wanted to make sure that whatever we do, uh, we are applying the best scientific practice, existing scientific practices, and we're very transparent on our calculations. So for instance, now, in a couple of projects we'll be working, the model validation report, we will actually publish it in a scientific journal. So it is our belief that what we see in the kind of climate tech space, there's a very dangerous tendency that a lot of venture capitalists, for instance, what they saw that what worked in the, let's say, social media sector, they try to copy paste the same model into the carbon markets. And we don't think that works. In, in social media, if I build an algorithm that pre predicts your behavior in a YouTube, for instance, I don't have to be transparent about that algorithm as long as it works. I don't need to uh, disclose how I came up with that algorithm. Carbon market is a company. Unfortunately, you should actually, yeah. there should be far more transparency, but, but we let it yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. 
The carbon markets is based on trust. If I'm selling you a ton of carbon, you want to know that, ah, oh, well, is that the way, how did I calculate my baseline? How did I model it? All that should be transparent. All that should go through a scientific peer review process, we believe. So we believe that if we are building a DCM 2.0, it has to be based on science. It has to be based on transparency. And we discussed, i am just come back from Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi is the, evolving as a kind of a climate finance hub. I had long discussions with the different marketplaces, the different buyers. Definitely, we need more transparency. And, and going this kind of black box model that I'm telling you, I, I have a X amount of carbon and I can't reveal you how I came up with the figure. We don't think you can build a functioning market that way. So it has to be based on science. I think it's a very important point that you make, and that actually leads me to what I wanted to ask. The next question is, help us understand a little bit about the technology. I think we have wrapped our head a little bit around the business, the customers and the services and the overall trends. It's time to deep dive a little bit into your black box, the technology. Yeah, so the thing is for us, it's not a black box. So if our clients advise an estimation of, carbon sequestration from us, the client has to be able to verify that however we came up with our figure is a scientifically robust way. So it is typically a combination of, we're not just looking at AI or let's say machine learning, uh, but we're combining, we, we are using institute samples, we're using satellite data, we are using machine learning as well in processing and analyzing that data. And then we are using so-called process-based models it's basically model the how uh, carbon cycles in the biosphere, in the soil. All of that is based on peer-reviewed uh, science. And, and as we, as for instance, client gets the validation report, it's all based on transparent science. So I would say it's a combination of different tools, which are all based on good scientific practices. Even then, the non-AI part of the modeling is extremely complicated. We have somebody who is a postdoc in math just running the computations all the time. We have, typically when you work with ecosystem models, we need to calibrate these models to each project area. And then we use something which is called a Bayesian interference. So it's also computationally very heavy. We can simulate millions of times potential outcomes of, with different parameters, how the carbon will flux how the carbon pools will develop under different management scenarios. But because we use these process-based models, so for instance, many times we hear criticism that, okay, now maybe you can demonstrate that you can uh, store uh, this amount of carbon with this improved management practice in soils. But how about what if climate changes in the next 20, 30 years? The good thing we use these process-based models is that we can also model that. We can model different scenarios with different climate scenarios, with different management practice scenarios that can be all in incorporated on this process based different kind of sensitivity analysis and a scenario a modeling well i understand that you're making a distinction between artificial intelligence and machine learning models and non-artificial intelligence and machine learning models process-based models and so on and so forth what i'm intrigued to understand is wouldn't machine learning for example or artificial intelligence help in the computational aspects of these process-based models? I mean, this 25, 30 years later, multiple climate variables may change, and you know, that type of thing is what artificial intelligence is supposed to be doing for us, right? I'm not an expert, so you, know, you have to explain this to me. We are definitely using artificial intelligence. One of the main things, which is kind of a traditional use of artificial intelligence in Earth observation, land cover classification. So we are teaching the, the machine uh, how different, what type of land cover is different image. Is this crop land? Which type of crop it is? So you can even detect from space. You can tell we have rye growing in there. We have a cover crop growing there. That is a very important application of AI. That AI alone is not a, a silver bullet. Uh, there is a very rich science of ecological uh, modeling and forecasting, which includes AI and uses parts of AI, but it's not a silver bullet that can solve everything. And there are pros and cons to it. One con in these machine learning models is that the purpose of a machine learning model typically is just to be good at predicting things, but it can typically use 
even millions of parameters. So that it can become more difficult to us say, okay, what if the temperature over 30 years increases one uh, Celsius in this area? What will happen for the soil carbon stock? Typically in machine learning models, we can't do it because we have millions of parameters. When in process-based models, we have a very limited or clear set of parameters and we can see, okay, let's tweak these parameters, what will happen for the soil carbon stock? So again, AI is very important. We use it in different phases of the work, but it's not a silver bullet that can just replace everything. And there's pros and cons to it. And there's very incredible kind of statistical, uh, ecological models that can also be useful. And it's, it's more about using the right model in the right place and the right data source in the right place and combining, bringing it all together. That matters. Well, that's, I think, logically understood, the right model for the right problem. Apart from understanding land cover data and interpreting satellite data, which I think a lot of companies do, is there any other way you use artificial intelligence and machine learning in your work? Just give an example or two. It can also, I mean, we are now looking different ways just to uh, also estimate the biomass, the above ground biomass. I mean, our name is soil, so, but we don't just do soil. Soil is the most difficult, one of the most complicated ecosystem carbon pools to model. So yeah, especially on the above ground biomass, woody above ground biomass. We are interested on the above ground biomass because uh, in nature, it's, it's a quite easy ratio. Typically, if we take the dry weight of the biomass, 50% of that is carbon. So if they can tell you from the satellite image that here we have a change in the above ground biomass from, let's say, 40 tons per hectare to 60 tons per hectare, it is very easy then once I know the the dry weight of the biomass, it's pretty much 50% of that is carbon. Especially there, our, uh, machine learning is also very useful to work on these different models that we we can estimate how much above ground biomass uh, there is. And it's also connected, the above ground biomass is also connected with the soil carbon because we can teach soil as a compost. Let's say you have a compost on your backyard. How much compost are you get? It depends how much biomass you're putting in. If I'm putting in more biomass, uh, banana peels and leaves, I'm getting more carbon, right? There's also a connection between this, both the upper ground and below ground plant biomass and the soil carbon, because that, especially the dead litter of that upper ground and below ground biomass is then an input into the soil carbon as a pool. So all of those two pools are very much connected. Extremely interesting. I wanted to go back to the beginning where you said you had three types of customers, right? And so can you just give us an example to make all of this, the technology come alive with what you have done for any one customer? Yes, some examples. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of different projects. In South America, we, we work with the project developers. We work with a group of ranchers who have a kind of overgrazed and degraded land. So there we are, we are basically helping to, to sample and model the, the potential benefits from uh, transferring to rotational and recently grazing. That is a, an example we would do, a pro, kind of a project we would do with the, a project developer. And there typically the socioeconomic part is more simple because we just have a, a group of ranchers together and, and it necessarily doesn't need that much of socioeconomic programming. Then when we work with the international development agencies, typically the, the size of an individual pot is much smaller. A typical smallholder, for instance, in, in Africa has a, maybe one or two hectares of land. It's much more challenging to aggregate enough smallholders in a group. And then also it's very important because then eventually you end up having thousands or tens of thousands or sometimes hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers in the program. So now, of course, it almost becomes a, a political issue. So then also all this, it's, it's very important, these true practices also increase the yields, that they, they improve the food security. In East Africa, for instance, we are working with the NGOs that are helping smallholder farmers to uh, increase carbon stocks on the, on the fields so of plants, for instance, with agroforestry, but also increasing the soil organic carbon and also increasing the yields. Then we have not typically a little bit larger scope of our role with one of the UN agencies. We are even helping them to design an entire climate strategy because they have a number of interventions on the ground. A lot of those interventions actually restore landscape, but they don't know how much carbon they haven't ever 
quantify the carbon, how much they are sequestering the carbon versus the baseline. So for instance, today what we are doing, we are first of all quantifying the existing activities, and then we are seeing whether there is a way to connect them with, with the climate finance to scale these, these activities. It doesn't have to be a necessarily voluntary carbon market. One thing which is also very interesting is this Article 6.2 and these bilateral carbon offsets in between countries, so-called ITMOs. That would be typically with the development agencies, we have a much larger scope. So there we work also like a, a climate advisor, of not just measuring the carbon, but also helping to identify the climate finance mechanisms and, and co-designing the entire interventions. As I mentioned earlier, that we know that we also sequestering carbon, but we also improving the food security. And soil organic matter is an incredible thing because the more we have soil organic matter, the higher yields we have with the less input costs. Soil organic matter has all the three macronutrients, phosphorus, potassium, and nitrogen, and it has the carbon. So we think, especially when we work with the soil organic matter, the biggest uh, benefits for the smallholder farmer come from uh, the increased yield. So the carbon credit is actually just a, we think the whole project benefits as a cake. The carbon credit is just a, a thin layer in the bottom. The biggest benefits come from the sustainable uh, increase on yields. I wanted to go back to that Kenyan NGO example that you gave, because I've been on my podcast interviewing some of these nonprofit organizations. I've also worked in Kenya and Tanzania. A typical NGO, maybe a local NGO, has been working with farmers for, let's say, a decade on sustainable agricultural practices. When would they come to you and what would they get in return? Yeah, so where we help them is that typically the way they have been collecting data is not scientifically robust enough, first of all, to make claims in the carbon market or to access these different financial mechanisms. So sometimes we start by kind of taking an inventory or stock of the existing activities and what is the, the impact of those activities on, for instance, soil carbon pools or above biomass. We can also, through satellites, we can access the historic data as well, up to 2030 years. So we can see what's been going on in the past. And, we, and, and then we can help them on the research design, maybe looking at a bundle of different activities and then quantifying what is the effect of these improved practices on these greenhouse gas fluxes and on the carbon pools. And then reporting this in a scientifically robust way. We sometimes even do a scientific publication based on that. All these findings, all this data, then we can develop the documentation that is required, for instance, the certification standards to, to certify the project as a carbon credit project. So where we help, first of all, creating adequate evidence that is a scientifically robust evidence. And then with that evidence, you go to the carbon market and then raise, increase scale and increase funding. The scale of the carbon project has to be quite large, as, as you probably know, so that we can cover all the fixed costs which are related to the certification. So uh, many times uh, with this, once you have kind of enough evidence, enough data, and you have reported it in a more scientifically robust way, then you can use that evidence to, to access more uh, funding than from the, either whether it's a voluntary carbon market or, or a different climate finance mechanism. I think the point that you're making of carbon markets or different type of climate finance mechanism is an important one. I want to also understand the example that you gave about South America. So, for example, there is this group of ranchers which is in and the land is degraded. When would they come to you? When they're thinking about a new type of farming or when they have already started and want to understand a little bit more about the quantification? There's different ways of thinking about carbon. As an ecologist, Carbon, ecosystem carbon is a very good indicator of the ecosystem health. By carbon credits, many times what we see, for instance, with rangers, they're not necessarily that interested only of the monetary value of that carbon credit. They're actually interested of ecosystem carbon as a, almost like a key performance indicator of how well they're managing the landscape. One of the ranchers where we work, he has a large ranch, uh, 20,000 hectares. He says that he knows that if the soil organic carbon increases, 
the solar organic matter increases. If the solar organic matter increases, then he's producing more grasses in a sustainable way. If he's producing more grasses, that means his livestock has more forage to eat. So he sees solar organic carbon as a, as a main indicator of sustainability of his ranching operation. And he's saying, I heritage this ranch. I want to give it to my kids in a better condition than I found. That's why I want to track solar organic carbon. And I want to try to increase it. And I want to build a, a system to, to scientifically monitor it. I'm just highlighting that sometimes we face this uh, a little bit like a carbon tunnel vision that we only talk about carbon, carbon, carbon. We need to think how this carbon is connected to, to other things, biodiversity, crop yields, forage yields, and, and those kind of things. And many times when we talk to people on the ground, they are much more interested on those co-benefits of the carbon than the carbon itself. Perfect. I couldn't have asked for a better kind of summary because this is what, exactly what I was trying to wrap my head around. What we have learned from you is that the soil organic carbon and the soil organic matter improve soil fertility and improves biodiversity. Carbon finance is a small component of compensating for some of the efforts of improving soil quality in the first place. And I think also the interesting thing about what you said is in your work is that you use a variety of computational methods to be able to assess both the soil organic carbon as well as the UD biomass on top of the soil. And some of it uses artificial intelligence, but some of it uses the rich heritage of uh, statistical ecological modeling, which has people in your profession have been practicing for many, many years. To my mind, a very interesting takeaway. And I think what I really liked is the range of organizations that can use these services, you know, from international organizations who are perhaps thinking about climate finance line $40 million for reforestation in a degraded environment. In which carbon finance is just one component of that $40 million. There are other mechanisms as well, but along with the large organizations which are working in South America to relatively smaller NGOs in Kenya and Tanzania, for whom the carbon finance is an important sustaining activity for their overall operations. So it's, you know, it's very rich what you have said so far. Yes, absolutely. One thing I'm very curious about is that in organizations like yours, where you're trying to do a very complicated set of services, what type of people do you hire? It's very difficult to find certain profiles, but we are quite interdisciplinary group of people. We have ecologists, we have earth observation data scientists, we have purely uh, quantitative people, so people who are postdocs, PhD, machine learning. Bayesian statistics. We have people who have uh, more experience on the land management, agricultural practices. When we talk about the risks related to carbon removals and nature-based solutions, that carbon, even if it's not stable, it's, it's a cycle. The carbon in the soil, the carbon in the Amazon forest, it has been there for a million years. The main risks come from human behavior. So if we want to reduce the risk of non-permanence, for instance, in nature-based solutions, we have to understand better the human behavior in the project area, the socioeconomic factor. So we are increasingly also helping our clients on that, on modeling the human behavior component, that what kind of a set of policies, a set of incentives would be the most likely to, uh, to kind of produce a long-lasting change in, in behavior and, and truly incentivize a sustainable land management. So we are also, uh, myself, as I mentioned, I see myself as an ecological economist. We're also looking at the kind of the socioeconomic component, helping to, to identify the right kind of uh, socioeconomic indicators, what to collect, and how are those socioeconomic indicators connected with these, these carbon stocks and, and ecosystem health indicators. Ecological economist meets behavioral scientists in your team. And if people have to get in touch with you, how should they? They can reach out through our website. It's www.soilwatch.eu. Or they can just look me up in, in LinkedIn as well as Jonah McCullough in LinkedIn. Lovely. And we'll have these uh, references in the show notes. 
Thank you very much, Juna. It was wonderful speaking to you. Thank you, Senzo. It's been a pleasure.